Dallas-Fort Worth with Chip Moody, Clarice Tinsley, Wayne Shattuck, and Brett Lewis. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Here's what's making news this Monday night. There has been a bloody military coup some 1,400 miles south of here in the Central American nation of Guatemala. Self-proclaimed president and born-again Christian General Ephraim Rijos Montt was overthrown by his defense minister, Oscar Mejia Victorias. In Washington, the U.S. State Department says it welcomes any concrete step to restore democracy in Guatemala. We have more tonight from Richard Wagner in Guatemala City. The coup was effected early this morning as Guatemalan Army troops moved into positions around the National Palace. According to Army sources, a helicopter opened fire on palace troops loyal to President Rios Montt. The sources said at least 15 soldiers were wounded in the brief but fierce firefight. It was all over in less than an hour. The national radio was seized and the Guatemalan people were told all elements of the nation's armed forces supported the overthrow of Efrain Rios Montt. At the moment of the coup, the status of Rios Montt himself was not disclosed. The army sources said the coup was carried out because Rios Montt had become dominated by what they called aggressive and fanatic religious groups who were taking advantage of their positions of power and using the government for their own ends. The sources said Rios Montt and his co-religionists intended to stay in power indefinitely. Rios Montt had promised national elections for a constituent assembly in 1984 and for the presidency in 1986. Efrain Rios Montt had said repeatedly he would not be a candidate for the office of president. Richard Wagner, CBS News, Guatemala City. Meanwhile, it's being called Big Pine II, joint military maneuvers between the United States and Honduras in that Central American country. The maneuvers haven't yet begun, but speculation about their outcome has. Opposition leaders fear Honduras may turn into a base for America's response to instability in Central America. But Hondurans welcome the U.S. help. Some say the maneuvers will equip Hondurans to avoid conflict and better defend themselves. The United States is also getting into position in Africa to assist the embattled country of Chad. Two AWACS radar planes landed in the neighboring Sudan today. They will be joined by reconnaissance aircraft and together will monitor Libyan activity. The information gathered could help prevent further attacks like the renewed raids today on the city of Faya Larjo by thousands of Libyan troops. In a message to Congress today, President Reagan notified members that the AWACS had been dispatched to the region for a limited time. The president was required to tell Congress about the move under provisions of the War Powers Act. Chip? Here at home, tense drama today in Fort Worth when a bandit, using a woman hostage as a shield, robbed the Arlington Heights Bank. The woman, Natalie Wickman, had been abducted earlier and was forced to accompany the gunman. After robbing the bank, the man fled with the bank guard in pursuit. Police then picked up the chase and some shots were fired, but nobody was wounded. The suspect, a 22-year-old Jordanian national, was captured after his getaway car and a police car collided. Ms. Wickman was injured when she jumped out of the car during the chase. Meanwhile, in Dallas, a robber used a bomb hoax to hold up the Southwest Savings Association branch office at Skillman and Mockingbird. Police say the bandit, a white male between 45 and 55, weighing about 160 pounds and 5 feet 7 inches tall, was wearing a blue jacket, a cowboy hat, and mirrored sunglasses. Bomb squad officers later determined that the purported bomb was some electronic component made to resemble a remote control device. Nobody was hurt. The man fled on foot. For years, developers have turned their backs on South Dallas while construction, jobs, and prestige flourished in the northern part of the city. But as Channel 4's Dave Tracy reports, tonight there is an ambitious project underway involving both the public and private sector to revitalize southern Dallas County. This is not the view of Dallas we see portrayed for most of our visitors. This is South Dallas, high crime and unemployment, low self-esteem and visibility. But now South Dallas and 200 square miles south of the Trinity River are getting positive attention. At a meeting at Dallas City Hall tonight, local business and civic leaders listened while Mayor Stark Taylor emotionally announced his new task force that will try to bring respect, if not a better life, to the 400,000 residents of South Dallas County. If we are to have a truly vibrant city, we must encourage and promote actions which will improve the standard of living for all our citizens. We must strive for balanced growth and development. We must provide fair and equitable services for all citizens wherever they live. 
And I'm confident that this group can do exactly that. The task force has 115 members, several committees, and has until this December to come up with a viable plan to put life back into the southern sector of Dallas. Organizing Chairman Bob McElhaney, the director of the city's Housing and Neighborhood Services, said the idea to promote southern Dallas is the result of pressure groups. And you got the Oak Cliff Chamber of Commerce, for example, very active. You got the Black Chamber of Commerce, very active. You got the South Dallas Chamber of Commerce, very active. You got active organizations who are organizing and putting the right kind of pressure on to say we're worth listening to, we're worth investing in. There were two major questions not discussed tonight. How much is all of this going to cost and who is going to pay for it? Without those answers, the mayor's task force is nothing more than another study on how to make Dallas a nicer place in which to live. Dave Tracy, News 4, Dallas City Hall. Coming next on News 4, a court decision which could have a big effect on local television news. And we'll also take you to the vineyards of West Texas. Hundreds and hundreds of people running and screaming for their lives. It just started, it just kept collapsing. Bring out your I wasn't drafted till the seventh round. They don't even know my name. The best. Croder, huh? It has a taste all its own. Enjoy it. For your fresh orange juice, we'll take your messages right and turn your bed down at night. Where he's touch touches for you, how it always comes through, working for your success, and no one will do more for that. And we wish you were rich, you were rich. Rush hour crowds had just cleared from a commuter train station in Jersey City, New Jersey this morning when a 50-ton steel and concrete ceiling collapsed. Two men were killed, eight others were hurt. New Jersey's governor said the toll would have been much higher had the collapse occurred just minutes earlier. Ironically, three workers were inspecting the suspended ceiling when it fell 25 feet. There had been a sag in the structure, but officials deny there was any suspicion of immediate failure. In Dallas, the DART election is only five days away, and supporters and opponents are using these last days to gain momentum before the final and official votes are cast. Mayors from the 21 cities included in the plan went before Dallas County Commissioners today in a show of unified support. But across town, the sentiment was just the opposite. Former Congressman Jim Collins hosted an anti-DART luncheon, where opponents again voiced their feeling that DART is a useless plan. The opposition got a boost today from Dallas City Councilman Max Goldblatt, who for the first time spoke out publicly against the transit plan. I have tried for three years to help create a transportation system that would solve the problems for this area. But as I see it right now, we are digging ourselves into a hole. We are, we are actually committing generations to come to a system that will not work. Goldblatt says he will continue to push for a monorail system, which he says would be impossible under DART. In other news, talks between the Bell system and striking communications workers are on hold tonight. But there have been no major disruptions of the nation's telephone system yet. 97% of all calls are dialed direct through automated equipment. But at Southwestern Bell and elsewhere through the giant AT&T network, supervisors are acting as operators. And management personnel are also manning the repair trucks for emergency service calls. Union workers say their request is simple. They want more money. We know that the, the stockholders share in it. We know that the public shares in it because of prices having been kept down over the years. And the workers themselves wish to share in it. And Southwestern Bell had wanted rates to go up for Texas commuter consumers this fall, but the Public Utilities Commission today ruled the phone company could not implement a $500 million hike to partially cover its rate request. Bell had applied for a $1.7 billion increase, the biggest in history. Chip? On the economic front this evening, banks across the nation increased their prime lending rates to a full 11% today. It's the first increase in the prime since February of last year. 
The news of 11% crime rate sent stock prices into a tailspin, but it's not yet known whether it'll put a dent in the current and continuing economic recovery. 38-year-old Christine Kraft today won a major lawsuit against her former employer, and it could literally change the face of TV news. Ms. Kraft, an anchorwoman at uh, KMBC-TV two years ago, claimed she was demoted for being, quote, too old, unattractive, and not deferential enough to men. She sued Metro Media, former owner of the station, for fraud and sex discrimination. Today, after two days of deliberations, a federal jury awarded Ms. Kraft half a million dollars in damages. I'm tired of the illusion of credibility. I want to see real news in television stations. I have no illusion, shall we say, that this is going to make a huge difference in TV news, but I hope that it does make some difference. If it keeps one news director in one station someplace, somewhere, from doing the same thing, I hope it does that. I would be the very first person to say that any company, whether it's a broadcast entity or any other corporation, has the perfect right to hire and fire whomever they seem to see fit. However, if they break federal law in doing so, it's another matter entirely. The jury, however, ruled that KMBC did not break the law by paying Ms. Kraft less than her male co-anchor. Well, the University of Texas is teaming up with a private company to get into, listen to this, the wine business. The company hopes to put Texas wine on the map. UT officials hope to make a lot of money for the school. Channel 4's Quinn Matthews has the first of a two-part report. The University of Texas has grown rich off the oil and gas from its more than two million acres in West Texas. But someday the oil and oil money will dry up. So UT is looking for other ways to make money off the land. And it is turning to the grape. In 1975, UT set up an experimental vineyard in Pecos County to see how well grapes could be grown here for winemaking. The results have been promising. You don't want your acid to drop too low. You want it to have still a touch of acid taste at the tip of your tongue. Try one. All right. I'll do that. What do you think? These are wine grapes. These are ready. <laughs> these are ready to go. Now, after eight years of experimenting, the University of Texas is about to enter the wine production business on a big scale and try to establish Texas wines as a contender in the national, if not international, market. UT has already bottled its wine on an experimental basis, but is prohibited by law from selling it. So the university this summer signed a long-term contract to lease the vineyards to a consortium headed by a Texan, Dick Gill, himself owner of a winery in Lubbock, and his French partners with long experience in the wine business, Cordier and Richter. They say the conditions in West Texas are good for making a premium wine. Because it's dry. And... It has very cool nights because of the elevation, which is uh, very good for the maturation of the grape and the berry. You are not trying to make another California wine out of it? No, not, not at all. It's quite different. We, we, we have no, uh, no uh, competition in mind. We, 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 no, our objective is to make a very good wine with uh, an identity, with an, a Tex Texan identity. UT officials think the wine deal will be lucrative for the university. Tomorrow, we'll meet the Texan who wants to turn the Permian Basin into another Napa Valley. Quinn Matthews, News 4, Pecos County in West Texas. Well, if you grow grapes, you're going to need some rain. And if you live in North Texas, that's what you're going to get tonight. Ron Jackson joins us with the forecast after this. got to sell our house. Yeah, but where are we going to find a buyer? It's not easy. Let me get started. A Century 21 office can find a buyer across town or across the country. Gotta keep looking. With over 6,000 offices, we have more buyers. It sounds perfect. When can we fly in? And we can show them how to afford Congratulations. it. Congratulations. We sold it. We sold it. Whether you're moving across town or across the country, a Century 21 office in the Metroplex area can really help. Highland presents the greatest sale in video. One of the finest selections of TVs and video equipment ever put on sale. Save on everything, including Sony, RCA, JVC, and more. This GE 14-day programmable video recorder is just $427. Save $122.
And this MGA 50-inch remote color projection TV is just $19.95. Save $404. Don't miss the greatest sale in video at Highland. But hurry, because Saturday night, the sale will be over. Sure, Grant. There are hundreds of them, and they're not all the same. In fact, there's one that's tested to such high-quality national brand standards, it comes with a guarantee. Eckerd Grant. If you're ever dissatisfied with any Eckerd Brand product, we'll replace it with a comparable national brand free. With a guarantee that's strong, we have to make sure Eckerd Brand is as good as you can buy, period. If your store brand isn't guaranteed, ask yourself why. Eckerd Brand products. You're going to like them. We guarantee it. Richard Dawson has a great time kissing all the pretty girls on Family Feud. And you'll have a great time watching all the fun and excitement as families start out shaking hands and end up fighting to the finish for $10,000. Family Feud is the action-packed game show that's winning with families everywhere. So grab a ringside seat and watch Richard Dawson referee the fun-filled fights. Family Feud, weeknights at 6.30 on Channel 4. Meteorologist Ron Jackson has the seal of approval from the American Meteorological Society. Wayne Chaddock is off tonight. You and I know it as ground clutter, but Ron Jackson calls it anomalous propagation, which is uh, all that garbage in the middle of your radar screen that's buildings and stuff. Stole that off of a weatherman up in Iowa several years ago. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> at the present time, though, Chip, there is no anomalous propagation on the radar. At least if there is, it doesn't being detected at the present time. There are some very heavy showers and uh, thunderstorms in the area right now. Here's Dallas, and here is Cedar Hill. This is where our radar is located. Here's 635. Now, most of the showers appear to be at the present time in southern Dallas, as well as southern Tarrant County, as well as northern Ellis and northern Johnson County. Now, most of the showers are more or less staying stationary, which means they have the potential of producing some... Uh, minor urban street flooding so if you are traveling southbound tonight you want to be aware of that looks like the heaviest showers and thunderstorms right now appear to be in mansfield as well as the cedar hill area well as far as super radar is concerned we're not the only ones in the state seeing scattered shower and thunder shower activity also some very heavy rains coming down in the lower rio grande valley also southwest texas reporting some shower activity there was some very violent activity in extreme southeast texas around the houston and Galveston area this afternoon, but most of those have diminished. And once again, generally clear conditions in the Panhandle as well as the Southern Plains states. This is the current satellite picture, and look at all the cloudiness in the state of Texas right now. The only star shine at the present time appears to be in the Panhandle as well as the Southern Plains states. Clear conditions up in the Midwest, but I think most of the cloudiness that is appear apparently appearing on the satellite picture will be sticking around at least for the next 24 to 36 hours. Temperatures from around the region right now a little bit on the cool side for this time of the evening. Readings are generally in the 70s and 80s. The coolest temperature appears to be at San Angelo at 72 degrees, while the warmest temperature, El Paso, at 88. Current conditions right now at 10 o'clock. Showers in progress at DFW Airport. Temperatures 76 degrees. Humidity way up there, of course, at 87%. Winds are southerly at 10 miles per hour, and the barometric pressure is rising. Our early morning low of 75, with the daytime high today of only 87. Officially at DFW Airport as of right now, just a trace of precipitation. The day's ranked 13 hours and 38 minutes. The pollution index out of Fort Worth in the moderate range at 76. Out of Dallas, a little bit lower at 75. And the pollen count starting off the week on the high side at 1,526 grains per cubic meter. Latest satellite picture across the nation once again shows high pressure in the Rocky Mountain states in control of our weather. Now this ridge of high pressure brought some very warm temperatures in the northern Rockies. Readings as high as 104 degrees at Sheridan, Wyoming today. This is the forecast map for tomorrow. Once again, scattered showers are expected for most of north central and, sec and central Texas. But by tomorrow, you see this cold front right here. It will be sliding towards the southeast. And as it does, it will be bringing cooler temperatures towards New England and the mid-Atlantic. Here's my forecast for Dallas, Fort Worth, and most of north central Texas for tonight. Partly cloudy with scattered thunder showers. An overnight low of 74. For tomorrow, partly cloudy with a.m. fog in the east, scattered thunder showers throughout most of north central Texas, a high near 88. For Wednesday, partly cloudy, humid with scattered thunder showers, a high near 92. Thursday, mostly sunny and hot, a high near 96. And for Friday, partly cloudy, continued hot, a high near 97. Anomalous propagation. I thought you learned that in weather school, not driving through Dubuque, Iowa, and picked it up from some guy on TV. That is the official term. Anomalous propagation, okay. ground clutter, false echoes. 
want to make sure about that. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. There's a test tomorrow. <laughs> in sports, the Rangers find themselves in Boston trying to catch up in the American League West. And Gary Hogaboom still thinks he has a shot at starting quarterback, but does he? Brett Lewis is next with sports. I'll bet you don't realize you're throwing your money away, but a lot of you are. You're paying too much for long-distance calls. Look, it's so easy to get Sprint. You use the same push-button phone, nobody comes to your house, but all of a sudden you could spend only half as much on long-distance. Still, a lot of you go right on paying up to twice as much as you have to. Now, why would you pay twice as much as you have to for anything? Call Sprint. Find out about it. X-16 right. At my football school, I teach the finer points of the game. And that training doesn't end on the field. Brute 33 left. And I show them how Brute 33 antiperspirant solid helps keep you dry and gives you long-lasting deodorant protection. Brute 33 right. And it's got the great smell of Brute. I teach my guys everything I know. Well, almost everything. Make every day your Brute Day with Brute 33 deodorants and antiperspirants. Time for the Rangers to reach down for that little something extra. I tell you what, they had a game tonight that if they go on to do well, this could be the one they look back on and say this could have started it all. An incredible comeback in Beantown. The Rangers in Boston to open a series against the Red Sox tonight. The Red Sox were leading 7-5 to five in the eighth inning when Texas tied it on a two-run double by George Wright. In the top of the ninth, Texas scored five runs. Mickey Rivers with the uh, game winner. Texas went on to win it 12-7 to seven over the Boston Red Sox. Two more games in the series tomorrow and Wednesday. Texas back home against the Cleveland Indians on Friday. First place in the American League West belongs to the Chicago White Sox. They won the first game of a doubleheader with Detroit, but in the nightcap, that's Larry Herndon's three-run homer in the third inning. That put uh, the Tigers up, and this really broke it open. Lou Whitaker in the fourth inning, a two-run scoring single. And Detroit goes on to take the nightcap of that uh, doubleheader, 7-2 to over the White Sox. Taking a look at the American League scoreboard, the Sox took the first game of that doubleheader, 5-4. to four. So Texas has now picked up a half game. They're only five out of first place in the American League West. Toronto and New York in the process of splitting a doubleheader, as are Milwaukee and Kansas City. Cleveland beat Baltimore. Over in the National League, it was the New York Mets defeating Montreal 6-5 to five, and Philadelphia pounding Pittsburgh 14-5. to five. At the World Track and Field Championships in Helsinki, Finland today, the U.S. finished 1-2-3 in the men's 100-meter dash. Carl Lewis of the University of Houston finished ahead of Calvin Smith and Emmett King. In the women's 100 meters, American world record holder Evelyn Ashford tore a hamstring in her right leg after 40 meters, had to be carried from the field on a stretcher. She'll be out of competition at least two months. We still cannot report with any certainty that there is a genuine battle for the starting quarterback job with the Dallas Cowboys. Now, the current number one, Danny White, had his ups and his downs against the Miami Dolphins Saturday night, including throwing two interceptions. But for most of the game, number two man Gary Hogaboom wasn't faring a whole lot better. Then, with two minutes to go, rookie Chuck McSwain turned this short pass into a 65-yard touchdown to bring Dallas within four, 17 to 13. But, of course, the yardage was more to the credit of McSwain and his efforts than anybody else. Still, it gave Dallas a breath of life, and Hogaboom took advantage of it, looked good on the final drive, hit three third-down passes to keep it alive, and set up the winner. McSwain's two-yard TD run with two seconds left has presented Dallas with a 20-17 to win. But did he make up ground on White? Well, there's always, uh, you know, some competition, but, uh, you know, Danny White's uh, been one of the top quarterbacks in this business for three years. I mean, you don't dis discount that at all. It takes a, a real move by Gary to, to move into his position, and he knows it. Gary knows it. He knows, uh, he knows what's going on, but he's making his effort. I mean, you never know in this game what happens. All I can do is go out and perform the best I possibly can. And uh, whatever that is, it's Coach Landers' decision to uh, decide who the starting quarterback is going to be. It had, it's totally out of my hands. I'm not worried about it. That's great. He took advantage of the opportunity he had, and, and that's and that's great. And uh, you know, I'm just I'm just happy we came back and won the game because it's going to instill some confidence in our team and in our ability to, to come back and win the close game. Well, I thought it was very good for the first game on uh, both both of the quarterbacks. Uh, uh, Gary was in on the second and fourth quarter, so that gave him uh, the two-minute situations, the more exciting situations, the situations where the defense is spread out a little more. And uh, a situation like this, a game like this, gives him experience. Danny spends through these types of situations, and Gary hasn't. So uh, it gives him experience, and it's going to make that battle for the quarterback job a little more uh, spicy. 
It still seems like a long shot for Hogaboom, but until Landry says the job is White's period, it'll be a topic of conversation for Cowboy fans and players. Finally, preseason games are the time to work on fundamentals. There is nothing more fundamental than picking up fumbles. Let's go back to Saturday night in the exhibition game between the Dallas Cowboys and Miami Dolphins. Here comes the fumble. Now pick it up and run with it, Rod Hill. No, he misses it. Now the Dolphins have a chance to get it. No, they miss it. When all was said and done, it left rookie quarterback Dan Marino with the kind of situation you like as a quarterback, second down and 39. Reminds me of that Don Meredith line where he said, at that point, you go to the coach and say, Coach, do you have any plays you haven't told me about, like on second and 39? <laughs> Thank you, Fred. <laughs> with that, sports fans, time for us to turn out the lights and end the Monday night edition of News 410. Tomorrow, Ron is calling for thunder showers, scattered, and temperatures in the upper 80s. Okay, until tomorrow. Thank you, everybody, and good night.